Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash carnivorecast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. This is a quick disclaimer before we start the show. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said here should be taken as medical advice. And please consult with your physician before making any changes to your diet, exercise regime, or medications. Thank you. And on to the show. Dr. Georgia Ede is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist specializing in nutrition science, brain metabolism, and mental health. Her two decades of clinical experience includes 12 years at Smith College and Harvard University Health Services, where she was the first to offer nutrition-based therapy as an alternative to psychiatric medications. I should also mention that Dr. Ede is the most listened to episode on my podcast of all time. Wow. <laughs> um, so people <laughs> really love when you come on. So I'm very excited to have you again. Um, Dr. Eid speaks internationally about dietary approach to psychiatric disorders, nutrition science, and nutrition policy reform. She's also the creator and director of the first medically accredited course in ketogenic diets for mental health practitioners. And in 2022, I almost said last year, uh, she co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for serious mental illnesses and was honored to be named a recipient of the Bazuki Brain Research Fund's first annual Metabolic Mind Award. Welcome back to the show, Georgia. Thank you very much for having me back. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. Um, so would love to just start high level. Um, and you've written a lot of excellent information on this. But how do you explain to people how our um, nutrition and dietary choices impact our mental health and the way our brain works uh, with issues like anxiety, depression, and other conditions? Well, I just wrote a whole book about that. Yeah. <laughs> so we can dive in anywhere you want. The book is called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, just came out this week. And so really that's what this book is 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 designed to do is help people understand how important and how powerful uh the your your dietary choices are in influencing your mental health. And there are lots of different ways that your diet uh changes how changing your diet changes your mind. But uh, so but when it comes to sort of big picture dietary patterns, the dietary pattern that we have been told for so long is healthiest for us is almost completely upside down. And so it takes a, many, many chapters to convince people, to use the science to convince people that that's yeah. the case. Because, the, you know, it's been, you know, we've, we've really been kind of steeped in this um, mythology about diet for so many decades. It can, it can take a lot of convincing to help people understand why uh, why it is that the information that we've had for so many years is wrong. But if you change your diet in these very particular ways, which most people have not heard about uh, and don't know uh, are, are so powerful, uh, you, can, you can see tremendous improvements in your mental health within a matter of days to weeks, even in cases of severe mental illness, uh, we has, we've seen that this is possible. So uh, I really want people to know that you know, if they've they think they've tried everything for mental health condition, um, they're willing to try one more thing. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of ideas in the book about about uh, what's really worth worth your time and energy. So, uh, yeah, we can dive in wherever you like because there are a yeah. lot of different connections. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I've always found um, the mental effects of ketogenic, low carb, carnivore diets to be the most interesting and intriguing. Um, you know, hearing stories of, um, I had Brett Lloyd on my podcast a very long time ago talking about oh, yeah. major depression and how he tried, you know, every drug under the sun and alternative therapies and nothing worked, um, the way changing his diet did. And 
I'm always just so fascinated by that. Um, can you talk about why these diets work well for mental health and maybe why, uh, like what is at the root of um, other diets impairing our mental health? Yeah. So the, the diet that we're told is good for us is uh, a lot of your listeners will be familiar with the pyramid. So this grain heavy triangle, it's got grains and beans on the bottom and breads and pastas and all kinds of complex carbohydrates. And some of them are even refined carbohydrates. Uh, so a very grain heavy triangle pyramid uh, where, you know, things like, like meat and fat are at the very tip <laughs> and you've got your vegetables and fruits somewhere in the middle. So, uh, so really uh, that diet is, is not going to accomplish any of the three tasks that a brain healthy diet needs to accomplish. So what a brain healthy diet needs to do is it needs to nourish the brain by providing all essential nutrients. It needs to protect the brain from damaging ingredients, and it needs to safely energize the brain uh, um, by keeping glucose and insulin levels in a healthy range. And so if you're eating this grain-heavy pyramid, um, there are a few problems with that. The grains and beans that are at the bottom of the pyramid, the breads and the pastas and the cereals and, uh, all, and, and all of those foods, they're very high in carbohydrate. And for some people, that's going to be an issue. For people with insulin resistance, that's going to be an issue, which is now the majority of us uh, have insulin resistance. But even beyond that, uh, even if you have good carbohydrate metabolism, you're relatively lucky uh, to be still metabolically healthy. Maybe you can handle that much carbohydrate. I don't know. But the, the foods that are in the base of that triangle are not nourishing and they are, and they are actually damaging to, to your brain so, and, and the rest of your body. These are foods that are very low in essential nutrients to the point that when you make cereals or pastas out of them, you have to fortify them with nutrients. And, and, and they actually contain the very high in anti-nutrients which interfere with our ability to access a lot of the nutrients that they actually do contain. And uh, the other problem with these foods is that they can contain a lot of defensive plant toxins um, that, can, that can irritate your gut, your immune system, your mitochondria, your thyroid. Uh, there's lot, lots of fundamental systems throughout the body. So there really is no biology behind the base of the food pyramid. And you know, if you have a choice and if you are willing to do this, my number one recommendation is to flip that pyramid upside down and make the core of your diet animal foods. Um, and because those are, they contain every nutrient we need in its proper form without anti-nutrients uh, and toxins and with, with very, very few exceptions. So these are the, the foods that are safest and most nourishing. And they're also the gentlest on your insulin signaling system because they're naturally very, very low in carbohydrate. So which, which carbohydrates raise insulin the most. And you really want to take pressure, take pressure off that insulin signaling system uh, to protect your health long-term. So, so the diets in the book, I have kind of a moderate carbohydrate, uh, low glycemic paleo diet as an option for people who still want to eat a decent amount of carbohydrate and, and uh, maybe have good carbohydrate metabolism. And then there's a ketogenic uh, whole foods diet for people who need to go further to get their insulin and glucose under control, which is quite a few of us now. Um, and then there's even a carnivore uh, diet in the book uh, for people who want to go further. So there are different places for, for people to grab on uh, to, to find out what works best for them. And it's going to depend on your goals and your preferences and, and, you know, how you respond to each of these diets. So I really wanted people to have a choice because I know for, for most people, the idea of switching to say a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet is not going to, it's going to be a non-starter. And I want people with mental health issues to know that you may uh, benefit substantially from, uh, from, from, uh, other options. I mean, there, there are other changes you can make to your diet that could bring you substantial relief. Uh, so, so that's why there's this kind of stepwise progressive approach to dietary experimentation to see, you know, uh, what, what's going to work best for each individual. Yeah, that's great. 
And can you talk about like what's going on in the brain when you have insulin resistance and your blood glucose isn't well managed? How does that impair our mental function? I'm glad you asked that. So yes, yeah, so insulin resistance, you know, what, uh, which now the majority of us have, depending on which study you look at and how you define it, anywhere between uh, you know fifty two percent of us and eighty eight percent of us, some see even say ninety three percent of us have some degree of insulin resistance. And all that means is that your insulin signaling system isn't functioning properly. And the reason why it's not functioning properly is because you have been bombarding your system with insulin, too much insulin. Uh, throughout the day, well into the night, every day for too many years in a row. (laughs) And so when you you flood your system with insulin, with too much insulin, the insulin signaling system begins to to put up a fight. You know, it it really uh, wants to protect itself from being overstimulated by too much insulin. So it, it starts to pull back and starts to tune down its response to insulin. So your cells start to become insulin resistant to protect themselves from this onslaught of insulin. So, uh, and what drives insulin levels up the most? Refined carbohydrates. What's second uh, is carbohydrates from whole foods. So carbohydrates stimulate insulin the most. Uh, All foods do stimulate insulin. Uh, um, Pure fat has almost no effect on insulin whatsoever, but most people don't eat pure fat. They eat mixed meals with fat and carbohydrate and protein. Um, So in any case, back to our story. So insulin resistance develops slowly over time, becomes worse and worse, the more uh, the more you abuse your insulin signaling system. So when that happens, the problem for the brain is that the brain will still be able to absorb glucose from your bloodstream, blood sugar for energy, uh, which it does need. It, the brain needs some glucose at all times. So the glucose will still even if you've got very severe metabolic damage, even if you've got type 2 diabetes, which is kind of an end stage form of insulin resistance, glucose is still going to waltz into the brain, no questions asked. The problem is that the more insulin resistant you become, the harder it will be for insulin to cross into the brain. And that's a huge problem because the brain cannot use glucose properly to full effect efficiently. Uh, to, to, to maximum capacity without adequate insulin. So your brain could be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be slowly starving to death. That is brain the insulin resistance of the brain that underlies so many of the mental health problems that people are either struggling with already or worried about getting in the future, such as Alzheimer's disease. So the brain needs smooth, reliable, source of energy uh, 24-7 in order to function properly. So when you have insulin resistance, you don't just have a blood sugar problem, you have a brain sugar problem. I mean, you can't process sugar properly. So you know, the, it's kind of upside down. It's a little um, paradoxical, you might say, or counterintuitive. The more sugary your diet is, the harder it becomes for your brain to use that sugar for energy. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, great explanation. I'd, I've always heard, talked about the importance of insulin resistance and brain health, but never heard it articulated so well. So thank you. Um, super great. interesting. It is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, we never think about this. I wasn't yeah. talking about this in medical school or residency. Or, <laughs> I had no idea yeah. uh, how that yeah. worked. And so I, I, I like to help other people see those connections too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there isn't Part of why I'm sure part of why you weren't taught it is because there isn't a lot of research in the area yet. Um, And and so I'd love to talk about your your study in 2022. Um, Can you talk about that study, why you um, co-authored it and and some of the results and insights from it? Yeah, great. Um, Thanks for bringing this up, because uh, uh, if people haven't heard about this study, it's it's pretty remarkable. Uh, and surprising what happened. So uh, yeah, I co-authored this study in 2022. This was the work of uh, my friend and colleague uh, in Toulouse, France, Dr. Albert Denant. And so he's been a psychiatrist in Toulouse for more than 35 years. And the people that he works with, the population that he serves is primarily people of French and North African descent with serious mental illnesses. And he's been working with some of these people for decades. 
So, uh, you know, d- but despite, you know, every tool he had at his disposal, me- multiple medications, repeated hospitalization, psychotherapy, and really good, really good psychiatric care, meaning he knows his patients well, he spends time with them, he pays attention to all aspects of their mental health, not just the medication piece, uh, really uh, 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 a wonderful psychiatrist. Uh, he noticed, like so many of us do, that most of his patients weren't getting better enough. And that's because the treatments we have don't work very well. So he had witnessed uh, in his own family, a fam- somebody in his extended family, um, a, a, a young man uh, with epilepsy and some symptoms of autism uh, had responded very quickly within a few weeks to a ketogenic diet. The seizures completely disappeared. Autism symptoms went down dramatically. And he thought to himself, hmm, I wonder if this diet could help some of my patients who aren't responding to all of the other treatments I've, are, are, I've already been offering. So he invited 31 of his most treatment resistant patients with severe mental illness. These are people with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and severe major depression. These were people who were taking on average five psychiatric medications, which is not at all unusual, um, who had been hospitalized uh, one or more times in the past with minimal benefit, uh, all of whom had at least one marker of poor metabolic health, and who had been in treatment with him uh, uh, for an average of 10 years, and in some cases, 30 years. So he invited 31 of these people uh, most of whom he knew very well, to voluntarily come into the hospital and try a whole foods, ketogenic, mildly ketogenic diet under his supervision in the hospital setting. And uh, 28 of those 31 people were able to stay on the diet for, for two weeks or more, which you need to do in order to start to see benefits. Three people decided to stop the diet. And those 28 people, every single one of them improved. Every single one responded to the diet beginning at week three, which is very common in clinical practice to see this. Uh, And uh, and to the extent that 44% of them achieved clinical remission from their psychiatric diagnosis. And uh, 64% of them left the hospital on less psychiatric medication than when they came in. So these, uh, and, and so this was really uh, unprecedented improvements for these folks, um, simply by changing how they ate. And, and this was not a randomized control trial. He didn't divide his patients into two groups and compare the ketogenic diet to a different diet. He was just trying to see if it would benefit any of his patients. And the results were so, uh, surprising, uh, that we decided to publish them. So, so that people could see how hopeful and how safe and how relatively easy this was to do in a very, what would normally be considered a very difficult group of patients, a really hard to treat, resistant to treat group of patients. So people got better regardless of how long they'd been ill, what the nature of their diagnosis was, regardless of which medications they were taking, how many medications they were taking, Um, And their metabolic health improved, of course, substantially. Uh, Weight loss, triglycerides dropping, blood sugar coming down, uh, blood pressure improving. Uh, And these, despite the fact that they were taking, in almost every case, psychiatric medications like antipsychotics, which are known to cause weight gain and a lot of metabolic Mm. health issues. So this is a really, really... um, uh, there's so much hope here for people, uh, whether you're taking psychiatric medications or not, um, people need to know that this is a safe and reasonable option uh, to either add to your existing treatments or to use instead of uh, treatments if you're not taking medication already. As long as you've got good supervision, you have to have good medical supervision to do this. Um, uh, but I think that this is this is a really, really hopeful hopeful development. And now we've got randomized control trials popping up around the world uh, to explore the, you know, to really uh, dig deeper, do a more rigorous study of these, of these types of interventions. Yeah, that's fascinating. I remember one of the first really interesting studies I heard 
um, about mental health and ketogenic diets was in mice or rats. Um, and forgive me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but I believe they had cocaine addicted rats and they wow. fed them a ketogenic diet and they, they lost their addiction to cocaine. Um, which I thought was so interesting. It was like, they were, they were speculating that it had something to do with like the dopamine enhancement of, um, insulin resistance or sugar, um, and being able to like blunt that effect almost through a ketogenic diet. It's super fascinating. Well, um, I don't know about that study, so I'm going to look it up and I'm okay. glad you mentioned it. Thank you for yeah. mentioning it. Yeah. Um, I do spend most of my time looking at the uh, human studies. Yeah. But- that that's a very interesting study. I'd love to take a look at that. Thank you for mentioning yeah. it. Yeah, of course. I I may have some of the details wrong. It was a long time ago, but we, yeah, we, we won't we won't take credit. We won't uh, dock your grade for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and and one thing you mentioned that I find really interesting was the timeline for people to see um, remission of symptoms or or improvements in mental health. Um, that three weeks. Do you think? That, do you find that it? Um, People talk about becoming keto adapted and then becoming fat adapted. They sometimes use those terms as like different things. Like keto adaptation is something that happens more quickly. And then fat adaptation is something that happens longer term. Do you, does the time frame to see results in terms of mental health run in parallel to keto adaptation? Is that what is really causing the, the big um, increase at week three or do you find it, it's something else and, and not entirely tied to that? Well, we need more research to understand exactly what's happening at these different yeah. time points along the way. Sure. But uh, and, and everybody's different. So some people respond within three days, some people in three mm. weeks, and some people right. need three months or even a little more, three to four months. But uh, but most people notice this is my clinical experience talking. And the the case reports that have been published so far, and Dr. Denam's work that I was just talking about, in most cases, people by you know after two to three weeks is when they really most people have started to notice a significant difference. Got it. That's that's really interesting. Um, and um, what what are some of the things like in conventional? You mentioned a lot around the conventional diet py- pyramid. But what other conventional ideas do people have either in the medical community or in the general public around um, foods that are supposed to be really good for our mental health, like brain foods you hear or antioxidant rich foods or plant based foods? And, And you mentioned it at the top, but what are some of the reasons that these may not be always the most mental health promoting foods? Yeah, so. What's so important for for people to to know is that the brain food strategies that they're accustomed to hearing uh, really don't don't work, and in many cases will work against you. And so, what we're accustomed to hearing is, you know, the more plants, the less meat, the better. Uh, the less fat, the better. Um, the more colorful fruits and vegetables, the better. That's what's going to protect your brain against oxidative stress because there's rich in colorful antioxidants. So you want to put berries on your oatmeal. You want to eat, you know turmeric and all kinds of colorful plant foods. You want to eat certain types of seeds like, like flax seeds for the omega-3 fatty acids for the brain. Uh, you know, so you, you want to, you want to eat more dark chocolate. You want to have more red wine, lots of these strategies. Uh, they're either based in scientific studies that have been conducted very strangely, which I can go into if you want. Uh, so they don't really have any they can't tell you anything about how the foods in the grocery store are going to affect you because they don't use the foods that you can buy. They use special versions. You know, they don't use blueberries in a little well, pint of blueberries that you can buy at the store. They use blueberry extracts and blueberry concentrates and special blueberry, um, uh, you, know, make, you know, special blueberry preparations that you, you're not going to buy in the store. Um, they, they use, instead of uh, dark chocolate that you can buy in the store, they use a specially souped up version of chocolate that's extra high in flavanols, which are these antioxidants uh, supposedly in, in dark chocolate. You can't buy this in a store and it's very bitter because they're very high in these antioxidants, um, which, which, which don't taste good. Uh, and uh, so they're flavanol enriched cocoa products. And, uh, and the other thing, of, for example, with red wine, 
Uh, they're not testing red wine on people with memory problems or depression. That would be unethical uh, because we all know red wine is, is a, a dangerous, risky substance to consume. And you can't really prescribe that for people in a research study uh, because of the risks involved. Um, they don't use red wine in the studies. They use resveratrol, which is an extract of, uh, 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 it's a chemical that comes in, that, that's uh, particularly enriched in red grape skins, which is supposed to have antioxidant properties. What it actually is, is a fungicide that the grapes use to protect themselves against, uh, you know, fungi and other predators. So they use resveratrol, concentrated extracts of resveratrol that you, you know, the, you're not going to, in, in one, in, in a glass of red wine, there's, you know, just one lonely little milligram of resveratrol swimming around in there. And it's, and it's, you know, 500 times less the dose that they're using in these studies. Wow. And, and it's swimming in a sea of alcohol, which is a powerful yeah. promoter of oxidative stress, the very thing you're trying to fight with that little tiny milligram of resveratrol yeah. it doesn't have a chance. So um, there's a ton of chemicals them. they can put in wine without even listing them on the label too. Is, um, I wouldn't be surprised, but, but yeah, yeah, is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. There's basically, um, I forget, but Todd from um, Good Farm Wines, I think is the name of it. Um, is it dry I had him farm long, wines? Yeah, yeah, Dry Farm Wines. Thank you. Huh. Um, he talked about how there's been lobbying for, I think there's a list of like 90 chemicals now that they don't have to put on the wine label. Um, so yeah, crazy some of the, anti-nutrients and, and just like weird chemicals they can put in a wine bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, drink at your own risk. I mean, the, I mean, these studies are conducted not for the good of public health. They're, they're, they're conducted to sell more of these foods. So they're conducted by the blueberry industry, the chocolate industry, the wine industry, and they're just really there to try to convince you to buy more of these products. Uh, but we don't have any evidence that buying the products that are actually available to you is going to be useful to to your to to improve your mental health. And in fact, like we were saying, the, the you know, red wine is not a brain healthy beverage. It is a toxic, addictive, potentially addictive liquid um, that damages every cell in the body, especially if you're uh, taking in more than your body can process, which doesn't take much to to overwhelm your liver. So, um, you know, this is not a good strategy. Um, and what you really want to know is not which foods have, uh, you know, are, you know, contain these antioxidants, uh, to fight oxidative stress. You want to know what is causing that excessive oxidative stress in the first place. So that rather than trying to fight it with these strategies that don't work with these antioxidants that you either have to extract and concentrate and, uh, um, uh, to try to try to even absorb them, we 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 are very poor at absorbing a lot of these antioxidants from plant foods because we don't need them and they actually have some side effects. So our bodies know better. If for the, the little bit that we do tend to absorb of some of these, we detoxify and spit out, uh, you know, our, our liver and our kidneys detoxify and spit out as fast as we possibly can to try to remove them from the body. So they're unwelcome intruders. They're not welcomed in with special receptors and open arms and retained so that we can, you know, uh, so to our benefit, they're, they're unwanted guests and we eliminate them as fast as we possibly can. What we want to know is why are we told we need all these antioxidants? Why do we have so much oxidative stress in the first place? And lo and behold, hmm, what could it be? Uh, refined carbohydrates and refined vegetable oils, all the ultra processed foods that are actively destroying the brain from the inside out, creating lots of oxidative stress, lots of inflammation, lots of, it's, it's, it's like you've let loose, uh, you know, uh, uh, bulls in a China shop. They just are very, very, they're randomly bumping into and damaging everything they encounter. So why don't we first do no harm <laughs> and take those things out of the diet so that our own, and most people don't know this, I mean, your listeners probably do, but we have, our cells have their own very powerful internal antioxidants. And if we don't overwhelm them with stuff where we were never meant to eat, they do a lovely job of mopping up all that inflammation and oxidative stress um, as, you know, as, as long as we are eating the right way. They are perfectly capable of handling oxidative stress all on their own. So it's just, we need to get out of the way. 
We need to stop overwhelming them with all of these excess free radicals from eating the wrong foods. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Um, and what are, what are some things, obviously people should get the book. Um, what are some small steps that people can take today to start improving their mental health through their mm-hmm. diet? So if you're starting from a kind of a, a regular diet, the good news is that just about any change you make to that diet is going to be a step in the right direction. So start wherever you feel ready to start. I mean, I give lots of different suggestions in the book about a single changes you can make if you're just ready to make one change at a time. There are certain single steps you can take. For example, uh, you know, no refined carbohydrates, meaning take the flour out, take the sugar out, the cereals, the juices, and just eat carbohydrates from whole foods, fruits and vegetables. And, uh, and so that's an example of a single step you can take. Uh, another single step you uh, can take is to, uh, for example, uh, take the grains out of your diet, even the whole grains, and go grain-free and see what that feels like. Um, take all the vegetable oil out of your diet. That's very difficult to do, but it's really worth uh, taking as much out of your diet as you possibly can. The problem is it's in everything now. So you go to a restaurant and everything's cooked in vegetable oil, all the salad dressings and mayonnaises and marinades, and uh, everything is fried in vegetable oil. It's almost impossible to completely avoid, but just do the best you can because vegetable oil is is toxic to the brain and the rest of the body. So you really don't want to be be consuming that. So there, these are some simple single steps you can make. But then uh, what I do in the book is I offer these three different dietary strategies that people can explore. If you're ready to make a more fundamental change to your diet, to the overall structure of your diet, um, uh, rather than just nibbling around the edges, <laughs> which you know is kind of what the Mediterranean diet does in my opinion. Is Mediterranean diet, it, the Mediterranean diet is better for the brain and the body than the, than standard diets. There's no question about it. Study after study finds this, but uh, I, in my opinion, it doesn't go nearly far enough in terms of uh, improving the nutritional quality of the diet, the safety of the diet, uh, and the, and most importantly, the metabolic quality of the diet, meaning it's far too high in carbohydrates for most of us who now have insulin resistance, who can no longer process large amounts of carbohydrate, even from whole foods. So uh, the Mediterranean diet's a good step in the right direction. Uh, but if you don't respond to that diet, there are lots of reasons why that's 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 uh, likely to be true. And there are other steps you can take that are more impactful. So I recommend as a starting place, rather than Mediterranean, if you can manage this, try a paleo diet as a, a really great starting point. It's safe. It's safe for children. It's safe for pregnant women. It's safe for people who are, you know, in their golden years. We don't need any medical supervision. It doesn't matter which medications you're taking. Uh, it's it doesn't require counting anything. It's a really easy, uh, really satisfying, and really um, much safer and more nutritious diet than than whatever you're eating now. <laughs> so a paleo diet's a great place to start. The next step, if that doesn't help you enough. If your blood sugar and insulin levels are still too high, because that's really our goal is to get get that um, brain energy supply back online. You need to get your blood sugar and insulin levels in a healthy range. You may need to go further. You may need to go into ketosis to to get that brain energy flowing again. And so that's a, a second option in the book. And then the third option is a carnivore diet for people who want to go even further and uh, or who don't haven't responded well or at all to these other strategies. And that really is the the diet that I kind of think of it as my secret weapon in my practice. I mean, a ketogenic diet is the cornerstone of my work. That's what I use most of the time, but I use carnivore diets fairly often, either as elimination strategies to kind of remove a lot of culprits all at once for people who are trying to efficiently troubleshoot um, the, their diet and mental health. I also use it as a great uh, uh, sort of a, a springboard for a ketogenic diet to get people quickly into ketosis the simplest way possible, because you don't have to really count anything. You don't have to, you know, um, it, it just it's just here's the list of foods. You know, eat this list of animal foods uh, to satiety. Don't count or weigh or measure anything. Don't worry about what time of day you're eating. Uh, just do this for a week or two uh, as your starting point. 
And then you can you can try expanding from there if you want to to sort of more uh, traditional ketogenic diet to see, you know, whether you need to be how strict you actually need to be in yeah. terms of your foods. So it's flexible. The plans are flexible because I want everybody to have a place to grab on and experiment to try to improve their mental health. Yeah, that's fantastic. I I like to think of diets as tools as well for the right person at the right time. Um, and yeah, a lot of people gravitate to carnivore diet because like you said, it's simple, it's yeah. easy, to love eating without restriction, without counting and just eating a lot of meat. Um, but it's not for, it's not for everyone. And it's, it's in a lot of ways, a very effective elimination diet, which you can then use to see what else you can tolerate, um, if you choose to do so. Exactly. Very well put. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Georgia. Fantastic to talk to you as always. Um, where can people find the book? And um, I'll have links to everything in the show notes as well. Thank you. Thank you for helping me uh, let people know about it. Um, so my website is called diagnosisdiet.com. And so diagnosis diet, and uh, there's a, there's a tab about the book. So look up at the top. There's a tab that says book or new book or something like that. You click on that. It will tell you more about the book and show you different ways you can order it, or you can order it and, you know, ask your public library to stock it. If you prefer not to, not to buy it or, or, or can't afford it, it's about $30, something like that. Um, uh, at least in the U S and so, uh, for the hardcover anyway, and I know that's not something everybody can, can afford to pay. So I, you know, ask your library. Um, to, you know, to, to, to put it, uh, to stock it for you. And um, the, if people want to engage with me on social media, I spend most of my time on Twitter or X or whatever you like to call it. That's just the format that I'm most comfortable with and feel uh, easiest to navigate, but I'm also on Facebook and I will respond to you there. And I'm also on Instagram, although it's a new, a newer format for me. So bear with me there. Um, so, you know, I really just, um, I think it's, really important for people to know that they have options and that these interventions can be really life-changing so that they're worth exploring even for a short period of time you know to see what's possible see what's possible for you um so uh, and I, I really appreciate uh the you helping me get the word out about it of course my pleasure well hope you have a great rest of your day and thank you very much Trip. thank you very much scott Thank you for listening to the show. You can find The Scott Mai Show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like, review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show.